Healthcare International was a brainchild of two Harvard professors. They intended the place to be the Mayo Clinic of Europe and what they thought they would do was intercept business from Europe and the Middle East that would otherwise bypass the UK. I came here on the 21st of June 1993. I worked in a porta cabin, very salubrious porta cabins, it has to be said, at the back of what is now our car park beyond the helipad there. We watched the building go up. We even watched them bringing MRIs across the top of the building and get dropped into place in the biggest crane you've ever seen. The hospital opened for business in April 1994. There was no expense spared in the hospital, you can see that now. We've still got the same fixtures and fittings in many of the areas that we work in today. So they spent a lot of money, they invested a lot in the marketing, etc. But unfortunately, went into receivership six months later. Early in 1995, the hospital was bought over by the Abu Dhabi Investment Company. Everything started all over again. We started to focus on new markets. Most of our patients came from overseas, the United Arab Emirates and Algeria, and very few of them spoke English. And of course, I didn't speak Arabic or French, but we worked with a very close team of interpreters. We were actually the Algerian NHS, so the government paid for patients to come here um, that weren't well off. So they came here with advanced diseases, uh, a lot of young children that came here and had cardiac surgery. A lot of these children came on their own without their family members. So it was quite an emotional time to look after kids for two or three weeks to get through their surgery. And you got to know and build up a bond with them and I found that very rewarding. In the early days it was a lot quieter to what it is now. So you could walk along the corridor you absolutely knew every single person and that's obviously not the case now. You wouldn't believe how few staff there were here in those days but also how few patients. It could be quite quiet. Main Street was deserted, you know, not at all like it's now. The other thing I remember how difficult it was to try and get patients to come here, trying to encourage patients and that was part of my job. It was really a sales tactic. I had to constantly try to sell the hospital to patients. They'd never heard of the place before. They were travelling up from places like Borders and Dumfries and Galway. They had questions like, how would I get there? Where would my escort stay? Would I have to get a local hotel? So this is all the the things that we had to say to them, you know, we've got a hotel on site. That was a massive asset to us at the time, because without that, I don't think we would have got through the numbers of patients being treated that we have done. What we were starting to do was more NHS patients at that point. So as a private hospital, we did a lot of NHS contracts. We did a lot of work for Glasgow at that point, but we also did for the local community. There was like the local solicitors, all these patients that um, had been unfortunately exposed to asbestos which was relevant you know to the local community and you know there's lots of people in the Clyde who worked who had that. We did all their scanning as well on a private basis you know for them so it wasn't like we didn't give something back but it was a very precarious existence we never knew if your job was going to continue. There were situations in our private days where we hadn't paid our bills, we had no money and you know I had a baby come in that needed laser surgery on their, um, their larynx and I had to get our chief executive then to pay for a laser fibre out of his own, his own credit card so that we could actually treat this baby. So the can-do attitude came very much from the very beginning here. Things went reasonably well, but not as well as the Abu Dhabi Investment Company wanted it to, and before we knew it, the business was up for sale again. In June 2002, we became part of the NHS. I remember clearly being quite excited that the NHS had bought the facility, and it was going to continue to be a healthcare setting, and that our jobs were secure. We were known then as the National Waiting Time Centre Board, but we soon changed our name to the Golden Jubilee National Hospital. We were going to be a National Waiting Time Centre, dealing with patients from all over the country and treating the longest waiters. We increased our workforce, there were a lot more nurses. We were able to support students through their learning. We expanded our theatres, we expanded within the building as much as we possibly could. We did have to work really, really hard at relationships and trying to get the NHS boards to work with us to persuade patients to come and gain a reputation because that's what we didn't have. We didn't have the reputation at the time. But before we knew it, patients were starting to ask for referrals. 
to come here. We brought in our own orthopaedic surgeon who was one of the Glasgow surgeons that had done private work with us, Andy Kinnamans, and he led a lot of changes then with developing that orthopaedic team. I came for the first time at the Golden Jubilee in 2003 and as an external consultant. We had only two theatres and then four and then five, um, increasing with the number of uh, surgeons, almost uh, one each year. I have been involved in uh, computer assisted technology since 1993. Actually, I designed one of the first computer assisted systems in the world. And um, uh, at the time, uh, this, the system uh, was commercialized and I uh, used it on a regular basis. And uh, um, I uh, wanted to introduce uh, this uh, technology in uh, my practice uh, here. And that uh, was in 2004. A lot of my colleagues took on board this type of technology, whether they were uh, so-called uh, navigation technology, like your sat-nav in, in your car, or robotic technology. All those uh, are used to improve the way we place joint implants. Overall, it is uh, definitely more accurate and more precise, which improve the functional outcomes of the patients, but also the long-term uh, outcomes uh, of the patients. We've had considerable interest from senior surgical trainees, both from the UK and internationally who are keen to do fellowships in our unit to gain experience in robotic assisted surgery. And we also regularly host visiting surgeons who are keen to observe robotic assisted joint replacements. The enhanced surgical planning gives us the opportunity to really think about how best to perform each operation. And during surgery, we have incredibly detailed live data on which to make informed surgical decisions in order to do the best job for each patient. We became leaders in the implementation of the Henance Recovery Program thanks to people like Mr. Kinneman, Jackie Brown, or Nick Scott, the anaesthetist, David McDonald. Through a number of national and international studies, we'd heard about how they were improving joint replacement pathways in, in Copenhagen. So went over to Copenhagen to find out what was going on, how they did things, and it really was a road to Damascus moment where we kind of uh, we're amazed that patients were getting up on the same day uh, after their surgery and were going home uh, two to three days afterwards. Um, so it was when we then brought that back to the Golden Jubilee and thought about how we could learn about that, what could we do here differently and try and drive that programme forward within the hospital here. We started off firstly with Mr Kinman's patients, we did it one patient and then we did it two, three, four and then we did that for six months and collected some uh, data on that and presented it to the rest of the team and then my role was to help support roll that out across all of our um, patients within the hospital. Um, so within one year we had reduced our length of stay here by two days uh, and improved our, our patient experience and patient outcomes um, fairly dramatically. People always think that enhanced recovery is getting the patients out, reducing their length of stay, and that's really not the ethos of enhanced recovery. What it is to make the patient's pathway as good as we can for them, to make sure that they're getting the best gold standard treatment. And yes, if they go home early, that's a bonus, but it's never the driver. The next big change would probably be in around sort of 2006, 7 when we were planning for the heart and lung transfer in 2008 and again we had to refurb all the theatres, plan for new pendants, new operating lights, work really closely with the teams. I spent a lot of time on the other sites working really closely with the clinical teams around you know, policies and procedures and making sure that actually everything tied up before the transfer happened. It was a really good unit in Glasgow Royal, a really good unit in Glasgow Western and a really good thoracic unit at Hermars out in, in East Kilbride. In UK and European terms however there were relatively modest units and the establishment of the Heart and Lung Centre down here really catalyzed turning us into one of the UK's biggest thoracic centres. And from a thoracic point of view, which is now my major specialty, has revolutionised the delivery of care, both at our consultant level and also the rest of the team and for patients. It was a massive culture shift for, for the teams coming together, so they weren't used to working together. Each had their own identity and they were very clear they wanted to hang on to that. So bringing those services together was a challenge to say the least and it was hard work 
I remember standing outside the front door when we'd finally moved to services with Anne-Marie Kavanagh and the sign was the West of Scotland Heart and Lung Centre and I don't think either one of us thought we'd ever get 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 it to that stage but it was a, it was a great day when it happened and I think it's it's grown in strength and um, looking back I don't think anyone now would say it was the wrong thing to do. A fantastic day came when the Heart and Lung Centre was officially opened by the Queen and Prince Philip and it was an amazing day for all the staff, it was an amazing day for the whole community. The place had a real buzz about it, it was a gorgeous sunny day and I had the pleasure of meeting the Queen and Prince Philip. I had the pleasure of being at the lunch. They excelled themselves in the Beardmore with a fantastic lunch for the royal couple. Of course, the Queen's no stranger to Clydebank because she's been here many times launching ships back in the day and she talked about that while she was here. So that was a lovely event. Over the next few years then, we had expansion projects every year. Every year, expansion after expansion across all of our services in the theatre suite and in cardiology, and there was a real focus then on innovation. I was first appointed to the Golden Jubilee in 2004, so I was the first cardiology consultant appointment by the Jubilee Board. At that point, the Golden Jubilee cardiology setup was relatively small. There's very few inpatients, there was one cath lab, it was all elective patients and there was very little cardiac surgical activity or activity in the other non-surgical services. And that changed dramatically in 2008 when all of the services moved. We moved from having one cath lab at that stage to having four cath labs. We set up a 24-7 primary PCI on-call service. Previously when we looked at the patients receiving angiography as an urgent inpatient, there was, there was very much a predominance from patients from the city because that's where the cath labs were. We're moving over here. It was a much more equitable service for the West of Scotland. Things really have developed very quickly and from a standing start, we're now the largest PCI centre in the whole of the United Kingdom. We now have five cath labs. We have got rapidly expanding services throughout cardiology, so it's a rapidly expanding coronary intervention service, now the largest PCI site in the UK, expanding electrophysiology service, expanding device service. The patients that, that are suitable for percutaneous options rather than open surgical procedures has grown immeasurably with the uh, increment in skills that we have but also the availability of the new technology. So the new technology really have opened doors to patients who previously would not have been able to treat it at all. We have a very well established heavy service offering very good outcomes. That is an alternative for patients who previously would have been a high risk for conventional surgery or to valve replacement. As well as delivery of clinical care, one of the big focuses of a hospital this size is the, of developing a research portfolio. We've contributed to lots of multi-centre randomised studies, really in all facets of interventional cardiology. So there are very active research within the heart failure community. Because we're such a high volume centre, we're often approached early to contribute to multi-centre studies and we recruit well to those. We've been involved in lots of practice changing studies looking at coronary physiology, which is a particular focus of the group here, of how best assess what patients require treatment um, and, and who would do best with stenting treatment. And also we've looked at the management of coronary disease in realms previously have been restricted for cardiac surgery, so what we call left main stem coronary disease or multiversal coronary disease. We have been very active contributors to the research space for, for that group of patients. When I started back in 2007 there pretty much was no research and development department and now we have a department which has about 30 people and about 100 projects on the go at any one point in time. So the direction of travel has been really interesting. We're able to open studies that mean that patients can get access to drugs and devices they wouldn't normally. We can be very good at certain things, hip and knee, arthroplasty, cardiac surgery, thoracic surgery. We can name all of our specialist areas in here. They are very good at what they do. The other thing that that means is we have a number of key opinion leaders in the organisation. Key opinion leaders attract research, which means we can do some fairly high profile um, research projects. In June 2015, we had another royal visit. Prince Charles came to open the Innovation Centre in the hotel, and again, an amazing experience for the staff and for the community. 
and we started to prepare business cases with a view to expanding the hospital, building what we saw would be an extension. And that took us a couple of years to get through that work. We did a lot around what would the optimum service look like, what would the best possible solution be for orthopaedics, best possible solution be for ophthalmology. In 2017, the business case was approved by the Capital Investment Group at Scottish Government. We appointed our PCP, we began to work with healthcare planners, architects, design engineers and got to work on what would be phase one of our expansion project. I think the design of the entrance in particular the patients really like. There's lovely manifestations along the windows and it's a very light waiting area. We also have bespoke self-check-in so it makes it easier for patients just to come and check in on arrival and then they just come through either to theatres or the outpatient department. Through in theatres, when you're waiting to get in for your cataract surgery, and a lot of people are understandably nervous about surgery to the eye, there's an internal courtyard with some lovely plants, so it's quite a relaxing area to sit just before you're about to have surgery. What was also important was that we had sight of what was happening within theatres and that's where we decided we would have a glass screen between two of our theatres. It allows vision for the theatre staff, it supports what we call our double lists. Um, some of our surgeons will move from one theatre to the other using the shared scrub area and they're able to see what's happening in the next theatre and what, at what stage the, the patient's at. If I think back to about just after I became Boy Director in 2010, at that point we didn't think we were going to be able to retain an ophthalmology service on site and we were having discussions about a consultant that we didn't think we'd any work for and now we're sitting with a dedicated ophthalmology unit that's doing thousands upon thousands of cataracts every year supporting folk from all around Scotland. Phase two of course is going to offer us another massive expansion joining the NHS Scotland National Elective Centre campaign where we'll be seeing patients for endoscopy and general surgery and orthopaedics and other five orthopaedic theatres through which we can help to treat patients waiting for a long time for hips and knees. It's an exciting time to really start thinking about how we're going to maximise the use of the building you know, when we're able to open it. I have moved around a wee bit, but I've had some fantastic times in my life, but this, since I moved here, has been the best professional time of my life. The Jubilee has given me 28 years job security as a private hospital at HCI before it, and then here I've moved to Clydebank. To, to be close to my work and I've brought my family up here. Um, I've got three children, you know, two, two of them are bankies because they were born in clay banks sort of thing. So for me personally, I've made my whole life here. I think what makes me most proud of working in the Jubilee is the culture. It's a culture of wanting to do the very best for the patient. I feel very proud of my colleagues, I feel very proud of, of the staff that work here. People do enjoy working here and people want to improve things ultimately for patients, which is why we're all here. We're all singing from the same hymn sheet and we're all trying to drive forward in improving patient care. And I think it's that everybody's talking and, and saying the same things to our patients really influences them, them feeling that feeling of confidence that actually what we say we're going to do, we deliver it. It's given me a huge sense of achievement and pride from just what we've achieved over the past 20 years. But also the people, you couldn't wish to meet a nicer bunch of people who I work with. I never fail to be amazed by what we can achieve as a team in this organisation. And for anybody I believe that's ever worked here, this place gets under your skin and you just want it to keep on getting better and better and better. And it has done in all the years that I've been here since 1993. Every year's brought something different. Every year's brought a new challenge. But we've never had two, two weeks that are the same because everybody just keeps on striving for more and for things to be better. And that's what's made it the amazing place that it is today.